I ran for governor uh, in 2016 because I thought the General Assembly and the governor at the time were making the wrong choices for our state. They were shortchanging education, uh, refusing to expand health care, providing tax breaks for corporations and the wealthy. They were hurting our clean air and water. They concentrated on divisive social issues and had engaged in what I believed and many believe was the worst voter suppression and gerrymandering in, in the country. And I believed all that needed to be changed. I also grew up here in North Carolina. I was educated here. I, I believe in my state and I believed that we could do better. And I believe that we have. Uh, we've made some significant progress for our state. Uh, we have been able to uh, move forward past divisive social issues. Uh, we've been able to um, push the General Assembly on education. We've attracted thousands of good paying jobs uh, to our state. And I'm excited about what I can do in the second term and look forward to doing that. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to begin by asking about COVID-19. Uh, you know, Republicans, as I'm sure you know, have been somewhat critical of, of your uh, response to the pandemic, but North Carolinians overall have, have, uh, have approved of the way you handled it, at least according to polls. I want to know what grade you would give yourself and why. <laughs> I, you know, I think we should get an A. And the reason for that is that we, uh, with our strong early actions and the persistence of most North Carolinians, we have been able to uh, help control the spread of this virus. We've been able to make sure that we get help to people who need it. We have made tough decisions. And I think the important thing about what we've done is we relied on science and data and we have listened to the health experts and we for example we put in a mask requirement in june and we saw our cases level off and when you look at other states that want to want to do things too quickly like my opponent does then you see problems, you see more deaths, you see more people getting sick. And I believe that by relying on science and data that you can make better decisions about how to move forward and that's what we've done. So I wanna ask about some other states because in, in some other states in school districts, both rural and urban, um, students are going back to class a little bit more than they are in North Carolina and there haven't been any real uncontained outbreaks. And I'm wondering if moving forward, whether that's informing your thinking, has it changed your thinking at all? There are certainly a lot of parents in North Carolina that would like to see their kids back in class. It is my number one priority to get our children back to in-person instruction. And this is why uh, a few weeks ago, we were able to provide a choice for our school districts for and option A for grades K through five. And we did that in consultation with health experts who believe that if we do it carefully, if we have a strong safety plan, if we require masks, then we can significantly reduce the risk of, risk of spread. I see the issues of children getting behind when they're not personally in the classroom. I see the problems that occur with mental health and with lack of nutrition uh, with a number of our kids. So that option was made available. We also, from the very uh, beginning, after we went to all remote learning in March, we, when we rolled out our new options, we allowed a combination of remote learning and in-person learning uh, for K through 12 that many school systems have taken an option to do. Uh, the problem with Lieutenant Governor Forrest's proposal is that it puts our children in danger. He's come out and said, we need to fill up our classrooms immediately, that we don't need a safety plan, that we don't need a mask requirement. 
And when you use our children as political pawns in that way, that's dangerous and wrong. I think we have come forward with a workable approach. Local districts can look at their data and make decisions about what is best for their students. We provided all of our schools with personal protective equipment. The new tests, uh, rapid point of contact tests that are coming down from the federal government, finally, uh, I think we will be using them a lot in our education system in order to make sure that we protect our children. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I use CARES, CARES Act money that the governor was allowed to use for nurses and counselors and personal protective equipment so that we can get our children physically back into school as soon as possible. So I want to ask about the budget impasse. You know, a lot of cities and counties uh, were, were unhappy with where we were left with that because of uh, funding kind of funding in limbo. Um, what will you do differently this time around so that doesn't happen again? Well, the first thing I want to do is to get a different legislature. And we hope that that will happen this November. I'd, I'd rather have a legislature that would elect a legislative leadership that truly cares about investing in education, that wants to close the healthcare coverage gap, uh, that wants to pass a bond to build schools, that wants to fight discrimination at every turn, wants to improve our workforce. Uh, so we hope that with a better legislature that we can have a better result. Now, I vetoed this bad budget because it once again decreased our tax base with sweeping corporate income tax cuts, excuse me, corporate tax cuts. And in addition, it drained money from the public schools uh, for unaccountable private school vouchers. It didn't do enough, it shortchanged education like most all of their budgets and it didn't take steps to close the health care coverage gap. And this legislature refused to negotiate. Now, you guys over the years sometimes have criticized me for compromising too easily. And so you know that they're screaming about me putting forth an ultimatum and not wanting to negotiate with them. It's just simply not true. We wanted to negotiate, to find a middle ground on teacher pay, to take some of their ideas on how we expand health care to working families in North Carolina. But this legislative leadership in their ruby red districts refused to compromise, refused to take any steps to move the ball down the field. Now that when this pandemic has hit, it's fortuitous that I did veto this budget and all of that money was not drained from the state coffers. And we in fact have been able to move forward to protect North Carolinians and to not be able to not have to do massive cutbacks of essential personnel because that money has been available. I'm, I'm always ready to talk and always want to try to find a way to move forward. And, you know, we have done that on, with some other in issues uh, with this General Assembly. But we're hoping that this November that we have a better General Assembly. And I'm encouraging people to look at their legislative races carefully to see which ones want to expand Medicaid and which ones don't which ones truly want to invest in our schools, which ones don't. People who truly want a clean energy future for our state, which ones don't. Ones who want to fight discrimination and want to have an independent redistricting commission and want to make sure everybody's legal vote counts. Those are the people that I'm working to help get elected. I worked to break the supermajority in 2018 and even with the most technically diabolical districts 
in the country, we were still able to break the supermajority. And that meant that we could stop bad things, but still it has been difficult to get as many good things out of the legislature that the people of North Carolina need and that working families need. I've been able to do a significant amount from my position as governor through my executive authority, but we need more. And that means we need a better legislature. Robin Tomlin. Hi, Governor Cooper. When you were running for office, you promised to ensure that your administration uh, would make fulfilling public records requests in a timely fashion a priority. Um, as one of the organizations that files requests on behalf of our readers, I can tell you that many have gone unfulfilled without explanation for months and in some cases for more than a year. As you know, the NNO and the Observer are part of a coalition of news outlets that are currently in litigation with several state agencies over unfulfilled records requests related to the pandemic. It seems like this promise may have fallen by the wayside. If you're reelected, what will you do to improve transparency and access for the public? Our office has produced tens of thousands of pages of records, including many in the case in which you're talking about. And I know that the staff at the Department of Public Safety and the staff at the Department of Health and Human Services, even in the middle of this pandemic, are working hard to get those records reviewed and shared and I have directed them to follow the law that's what I expect them to do they will keep working and they will keep working to make sure they produce every record that they're supposed to produce under the law uh uh, another question. After uh, we're, we're finally hitting phase three and, and lifting restrictions, but across the country, there's signs of a, of a surge um, in some cases. And even the numbers in North Carolina seem to be maybe ticking upwards a little. If that continues, what are the next steps? And are there any conditions under which you would shut things down fully again? Well, first, we will do whatever we need to do to put the health and safety of North Carolinians first. That has been my number one priority. Uh, I took an oath when I became governor to be faithful to the state of North Carolina. And that means I've been working every day to make sure that we put health and safety first. But this is one reason why we have proceeded cautiously and carefully with easing restrictions, because our stability that we've had is very fragile. Our cases have leveled off, but we still think the number of cases that we have is too high and we want to bring that number down. Uh, our percentage positive has finally for a while hovered around the top of where we want it to be, which is the five or so percent range, but we want to get that lower as well. Uh, the surveillance data, which helps us predict whether this virus is going to get worse with people presenting emer to the emergency room with symptoms, that has uh, continued to be steady, but it's still at a higher level than we want it to be, particularly going into to flu season. We're still worried about the fact that there is no federal strategy on testing. And we, although we're working as hard as we can, and I've joined a coalition uh, with a bipartisan coalition with other states to try to use our leverage to get more testing for our state, our testing is still not where it needs to be for us to get full control of the spread of this virus. And, and finally, what I would say, I'm concerned because although I mentioned earlier I think most North Carolinians have taken responsibility. There are a number of North Carolinians who don't and who believe the propaganda that masks don't work and who put themselves and others in danger by refusing to wear a mask, refusing to social distance, continuing to go into large crowds. And we have to think about that because when people do that, they contribute to the problem. And it makes it harder for us to get our children safely back in school. It makes it harder for us to 
protect people in nursing homes. It makes it harder for us to ease restrictions and it makes it harder for us to slow the spread of the virus. So we will do what we need to do to keep people safe. But the reason that we have moved cautiously and carefully, it's because we know that this virus could spike back on us at any time that we really haven't had spikes like some of the other states have because we took early action, but we want to be nimble and ready to move where we need to move in order to protect the public. Ned Barnett. Hello, Governor Cooper. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, even before COVID, the state prison system was in trouble. Uh, you had high turnover among officers and really chronic underpayment and uh, problems with conditions with the inmates. We just ran a, an op-ed, I don't know if you saw it, it was from an inmate at the women's prison here in Raleigh. She just described horrendous conditions there. You know, they have no air conditioning all summer long. <coughs> A lot of the toilets are broken. Uh, they're in these dorms packed in together with COVID kind of running through the population. What can you do to sort of better protect prisoners in this, in this pandemic environment? What can you do even in a broader sense to improve the correction system in the state? Well, one of the things that we're doing right now is my uh, commission on racial equity is working very hard uh, in order to look at the racism that we know exists in criminal justice. And I'm looking forward to them coming with some recommendations soon about how we move forward in that area. Uh, we, all, we know that it is extremely important for us to be able to protect people in congregate living facilities. And we've been very concerned about the safety of our corrections officers who are there and, and we mourn the deaths that, that occurred in our prison system and realize that uh, we have to do more to protect them. And what we were able to do was to get the General Assembly to raise their pay so that we can attract and retain better people. And we've been able to get that done. We provided for them uh, more and better equipment uh, to use like uh, cameras and safety equipment. We provided for them better training. And we also are, are working to, uh, particularly during this pandemic, get people into more community settings in order to be able to reduce the prison population and make sure that people can be isolated and treated uh, if they get sick and that we can put in place uh, uh, protections for them and prevention for them to keep them from getting COVID because we know that, uh, we know that it, there's a greater chance for spread to occur in congregate living facilities. Uh, so we are going to continue to work on our uh, safety. We need to look at criminal sentencing reform uh, I've, I have taken a personal interest in our reentry program where we are working with faith-based groups and nonprofits across the country to be able to integrate people back into society after they get out of prison uh, to make sure that they can have a prosperous life and they don't go back into uh, a life of crime or things that got them there to start with. We brought in a new director of prisons, in, uh, 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 Mr. Ishii, who is working very hard to improve conditions, to make sure that uh, people in inmates in prison get the opportunity to get training and to participate in programs. So I feel that things are moving in a, a positive direction, but we know we have to do more. What about the, uh, speaking of congregate living, you know, we had a pretty high death toll in the nursing homes uh, in North Carolina, I think above the national average. Did this whole pandemic expose sort of a poor management we have or an uneven management of these facilities? And then should we be doing more to, to upgrade them? 
I know it's a federal funding thing to a large extent, but there is some oversight by the state. And is there anything you can do to sort of make sure that we don't have these bad homes that aren't providing adequate care? This pandemic has taken thousands of North Carolinians from us too soon. And one of, one of the worst things about the coronavirus is the impact that it has had on our nursing homes. But that's why we took immediate action to provide personal protective equipment, to pay for testing, and to inspect every single nursing home in this state, citing the ones that have broken the rules. And we've been even recognized as a national model for testing in nursing homes. There's no question that more funding needs to be provided to them, mostly to be able to attract and retain better staff. And it's one of the reasons we were able to, uh, we use CARES Act money to provide increases for them, particularly during the pandemic when they were losing uh, staff. Uh, I think Medicaid expansion also would give us significantly more resources in the state in order for us to be able to, in addition, help nursing homes uh, with, with their people and to be able to compensate them. Now, you know, I've taken some criticism from uh, Lieutenant Governor Forrest about nursing homes. You know, I will say that in, in Georgia, uh, where he, he says that uh, North Carolina ought to be like states like Georgia and Florida. In Georgia, we're a pretty similar population, but they have twice as many deaths and 600 more nursing home deaths. And I think he wants to pretend that nursing homes are on an island and that we ought to be able to protect them while everybody else can do whatever they want. But it doesn't work that way. Our, our nursing homes, our rest homes, are part of our community and they are affected by community spread. And we had people encouraging others not to wear masks and to get into large gatherings and don't social distance. There it makes it a greater chance that a staff member from a nursing home or a visitor to a nursing home could bring the virus there. And we know how quickly that it spreads. Dr. Cohen has had a team of people to go in and to help nursing homes, particularly those that are having outbreaks and setting rules and regulations for helping them. But one thing we, got, we know overall, we've got to invest more in healthcare and particularly our aging population because our success in keeping people alive longer is, is going to provide challenges for us as how, to how we can humanely take care uh, of people. And as governor, I want to, I want to continue to work to improve those conditions and to provide the, the kind of funding that we need to make, make sure that our seniors are looked after and people who need nursing homes are looked after. And just one last question, but it's a, it's a big subject. The, you know, the university system has become, particularly the board of governors, just highly politicized and divided and a lot of people feel not very representative of the population. Do you think the university system is in some trouble now, uh, particularly as it tries to emerge from the pandemic? Do we have to make changes in how it's governed and what it's, you know, how much authority chancellors have and the role of the president, that kind of thing? Our university system is our shining star across the country and across the world. Uh, as I talk to numerous CEOs as I'm recruiting companies to come to our state or to expand, our university system is widely known for producing amazing workers, providing excellent innovation and research, and people come to our state to take advantage of it. And they, they also appreciate not only that great work, but its diversity. Uh, we have more four-year HBCUs than any other state in the country. And North Carolina A&T State University graduates more black engineers than any institute in the country. So let's recognize that this is one of the most important assets of our state. 
that has been built with people like Frank Photogram and, and Bill Friday and Erskine Bowles and, and others. And, and I do have a lot of confidence in Peter Hans. I've known Peter for 30 years. But the, the system of selection of university leaders has to change because, as you may recall, this, this power-hungry General Assembly, after I was elected, but even before I went off into office, went into session and took a number of powers away from the governor. Now, I've gotten back for this office a number of those powers through litigation. However, one of the things they took away was the ability of the governor to appoint any trustee to the 16 campus university system. So what you have now is a UNC Board of Governors and all of the trustees across this state of all the campuses that are completely controlled by the Republican leadership in the General Assembly. We have to have a new way to select leaders. Uh, the reason that they still have that power is because it wasn't unconstitutional. It's horrible public policy, but it's not unconstitutional. So I think we've got to change this. It's one of the things that I want to do. I think a lot of people who love the university believe that we have, not, not only do we need more uh, racial diversity, gender diversity, geographic diversity, but we need more diversity of thought. On, on this board. And uh, a, a lot of the board members answer to uh, the leadership in the General Assembly. And I'm deeply concerned about our university and its reputation. I know a lot of good hearted people want our university to continue to be the best, but I do think the challenges are going to be great. One of the things our university has to get uh, on board with quickly is making sure we are on top of online learning and to be able to compete in that arena where we know a lot of universities are, are flourishing. We've, we've got a good start, uh, but we need to do better. So yes, I'm concerned. Yes, I believe our university is still strong, but I do believe there are gonna be some significant challenges, uh, especially coming out of this pandemic with the way the board is governed and we've gotta find a way to have more representation of all kinds of people living in this state on the leadership of the Board of Governors and our trustees at our university. Thank you, Governor. Governor, I have a question for you. We had a, a lot of um, marches and protests this summer in, in North Carolina and, and continuing into the fall um, following the death of George Floyd. But the pro protests weren't only about policing, but about racial inequity and, and criminal justice. Talk about your legislative priority in the next session with regard to that. Well, the, the senseless killings of George Floyd and other black lives it has really broken open painful wounds. And they, I think these are scars that mark generations of trauma for black people and other communities of color and that they continue to suffer. And I, and I believe many others, looked in the mirror to reflect on how we could do more to fight racism. And I believe that we have to listen to people who are lifting up their voices for equity. And it's one of the reasons why I set up two important Task, force, task forces, one on racial equity uh, in law enforcement and criminal justice, and the other one on uh, racial equity in healthcare, education, economics, and environmental justice. That's the Andrea Harris Task Force. Uh, these task forces are already working hard because this pandemic is shining a bright light on inequities that already exist. When you have 22% of your population is black, but 32% of COVID deaths are black, there's a problem. When about 10% of your population is Latinx, Hispanic, and 40% of the cases 
uh, COVID cases are Latinx expanded, uh, Hispanic, you know you've got a problem. This is why we've been concentrating testing and, res and resources into these underserved communities. But we're going to have to do a lot more to provide for equitable, equitable treatment uh, in healthcare. Uh, one of the things that we've set forth in my early uh, childhood action plan is looking at infant mortality, and particularly among black babies. And we've seen some slight improvement before this pandemic hit, but we know that we have a lot to do. The first thing we have to do is to recognize it and to call it out and to have real leaders who want to get to solutions instead of fanning the flames of division and hate. And a number of our leaders are doing that right now. And I think that that is counterproductive and we have a lot of work to do. We have to recognize the problems uh, and we have to tackle them. Another thing we're doing, and we want to bring this to fruition, not only do we need to rec recruit more good students to become teachers in North Carolina, because one of the things I want to do in the next term is to get a good teacher in every classroom and a good principal in every school and make sure we have that. But the studies over and over again show us that all students do better when their teachers are diverse, and particularly uh, students of color. And I have set up a drive task force. I had uh, President Obama's former Secretary of Education, John King, come down to help us kick it off. And what we're doing is recruiting more teachers of color into the profession. Uh, one of the things that I've been able to push this legislature to do is to reestablish the Teaching Fellows Program, which is one of the greatest programs this state has ever put together in order to attract good people into the teaching profession. I was on one of the very first interview teams in the 90s, and I looked, I said, we're getting the top of the class who are willing to take these four-year scholarships and give us at least four years teaching at the public schools. But with, with them reestablishing it, it's too limited, and there's not a single HBCU as, a, as an approved school to be able to get a teaching fellow scholarship. So we're going to work to try to make our, our education system uh, of teachers more diverse. That's going to help all students across the board. There are too many disparities. Uh, I, I can go on and on, but right now we are working to try to help underutilized businesses and state contracts uh, to help develop these businesses. Not only is that good for them, it's good for the taxpayers because when you create more competition for state contracts, you can get things done at a better, better price. So we're going to continue to um, work on fighting racism, uh, valuing diversity. I've appointed uh, by far the most qualified, but also happens to be by far the most diverse cabinet and administration in history. And I think there is a correlation and a causation between a cabinet being the most effective and qualified and a cabinet being the most diverse because diversity is a strength. You get too many other, you get all kinds of viewpoints from people in a diverse situation and you become more effective, you improve your bottom line, and we're gonna keep building on that in my next administration.